We've got the Rolex in between because we're on a tight schedule. There we go. First, I'm going to introduce you to somebody you don't have to be introduced with anymore. But anyway, writer of essays, stories, poems, novels, works of great epic force. It started in 64 with the shadow of the sun, or maybe it started much earlier as a toddler, maybe at the age of four or five. Grand dame of British literature. But above all, lady with a passion for making things who enjoys writing. She became world famous, of course, with the novel Obsession, winner of the Booker Prize, also a movie. Also Angels and, and Insects knew a second life on a silver screen with a lot of success. The last years, she wrote that impressive novel, The Children's Book, shortlisted for the Man Booker, a book about artists' children with that intriguing character, Olive Wellwood, or the imagination of Olive Wellwood. And so we are at the center of this festival, or the theme of this festival, Imagine. Situated in late Victorian age with all the elements, politics, feminism, working class, artists, children, évidemment. More imagination in Ragnarok, the end of the gods, a recreation of the ancient Norwegian myth, raw myth. Those last two works will form the focus of our conversation, otherwise we'll be here till midnight. Not that I would mind, but... And of course, she is working on a new novel, a big one. Yeah. Then we're satisfied already. Uh, frighteningly big? Yeah, at the moment, I'm still doing the research, and I haven't reached the end of the research, which is the frightening moment. It keeps growing and growing and growing. Oh, good. Welcome to the fascinating world of A.S. Byatt. We decided that we would start with, by reading. Mrs. Byatt will start by reading. The beginning, I think, of uh, Ragnarok. Yes. <clears throat> I was asked to write a myth, any myth, for a series being published by Canongate Press. And there was only ever one myth I wanted to write, which was the Ragnarok, the death of the gods in the Norse mythology. Um, and I couldn't find a tone of voice to write it in. I just couldn't find the right kind of language. And so finally, I invented this character, the thin child in wartime, which is myself discovering these myths at the age of sort of seven, six or seven. Um, and I'll just read the very beginning of the book. Is the microphone all right? The thin child thought less, or so it now seems, of where she herself came from, and more about that old question, why is there something rather than nothing? She devoured stories with rapacious greed, ranks of black marks on white, sorting themselves into mountains and trees, stars, moons and suns, dragons, dwarfs, and forests containing wolves, foxes, and the dark. She told her own tales as she walked through the fields, tales of wild riders and deep mares, of kindly creatures and evil hags. At some point, when she was a little older, she discovered Asgard and the gods. This was a solid volume bound in green with an intriguing rushing image on the cover of Odin's wild hunt on horseback, tearing through a clouded sky amid jagged bolts of lightning, watched, need two hands, watched from the entrance to a dark underground cavern by a dwarf in a cap looking alarmed. The book was full of immensely detailed, mysterious steel engraving of wolves and wild waters, apparitions and floating women. It was an academic book and had in fact been used by her mother as a crib for exams in Old Icelandic and Ancient Norse. It was, however, German. It was adapted from the work of Dr. W. Wegner. The thin child was given to reading books from cover to cover she read the introduction about the retrieval of the old Germanic world with its secrets and wonders. She was puzzled by the idea of the Germans. She had dreams that there were Germans under her bed 
who, having cast her parents into a green pit in a dark wood, was sawing down the legs of her bed to reach her and destroy her. Who were these old Germans, as opposed to the ones overhead, now dealing death out of the night sky? The book also said that these stories belong to Nordic peoples, Norwegians, Danes, and Icelanders. The thin child was, in England, a northerner. The family came from land invaded and settled by Vikings. These were her stories. The book became a passion. Much of her reading was done late at night with a concealed torch under the bedclothes, or with the volume pushed past a slit opening of the bedroom door into a pool of bleak light on the blacked out landing. The other book she read and reread repeatedly was John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. She felt in her bones the crippling burden borne by the man mired in the slough of despond. She followed his travels through wilderness and the valley of the shadow his encounters with giant despair and the fiend Apollyon. Bunyan's tale had a clear message and meaning. Not so, Asgard and the gods. That book was an account of a mystery, of how a world came together, was filled with magical and powerful beings, and then came to an end. A real end. The end. One of the illustrations showed rocks in the Riesengebirge, a river ran through a cleft above which towered tall lumps of rock with featureless almost heads and stumps of almost arms standing amongst thrusting columns with no resemblance to any living form. Grey spiked forest tips clothed one slope. Tiny, ant-like, almost invisible humans stared upwards from the near shore. Wraiths of cloud veils hung between the forms and the reading child. She read, the legends of the giants and dragons were developed gradually like all myths. At first, natural objects were looked upon as identical with these strange beings. Then the rocks and chasms became their dwelling places. And finally, they were regarded as distinct personalities, had their own kingdom of Jotlenheim. The picture gave the child an intense, uncanny pleasure. She knew, but could not have said, that it was the precise degree of formlessness in the nevertheless scrupulously depicted rocks that was so satisfactory. The reading eye must do the work to make them live, and so it did, again and again, never the same life twice as the artist had intended. She had noticed that a bush or a log, seen from a distance on her meadow walk, could briefly be a crouching, snarling dog, or a trailing branch could be a snake complete with shining eyes and flickering forked tongue. This way of looking was where the gods and the giants came from. The Snowden giants made her want to write. Thank you. Now you wanted to make sure that people understand that Ragnarok is not <laughs> about the little girl but is about the gods, it is raw myth. You chose to write the myth. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the little girl is simply a way in and a way out. And I had a slight argument with the publisher because she doesn't have a name. And the reason is that she doesn't have a name because she's just a voice and an eye. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they wouldn't see that. They wanted it to be personal as everything in our day now is personal. So. Um, but you said no, no name. No, I said, don't you think I could have given her a name if, I, if she had a name? <laughs> um, she's always a thin child, too. I even tried to sort of slightly take her sex away from her. Mm -hmm. But she is a girl. She is a girl, yes. And, mm. um, like me, she has asthma. And like me, she has that great big green book. Mm -hmm. That was very important. And like you, she saw those rocks, and then we're at the center of uh, the festival theme, imagination. That's what it's all about, right? That's exactly what it's all about. I mean, the other thing she had was um, a huge narrative shock when the gods are all destroyed, because she had never read a story in which it ended badly, or in which everything got killed. You knew in advance with most stories. There were 
things that could be killed because the story could stand them being killed. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened at the end of Asgard and the Gods was that everything was destroyed and there was simply a black surface of water with some gold chessmen floating in it. And then Dr. Wagner said, um, there are Christian versions of this story, which we think are considerably later, which say that, of course, after that, there came a new heaven and a new earth. And then Thin Child thought, oh, no, there didn't. And I, I only thought when I started to write this how much the fact of the world being at war when I was reading it okay. affected my pleasure in the dark water. It was sort of looking at the worst and sort of saying, OK, that happens. Um, things fall apart. Things fall apart, yeah. Mm. Yes, and, and in a way, it's reassuring. <laughs> Well, it's reassuring that you can take a look at it. I think that's what stories are for. But, but that's the, I don't know many stories that end totally badly except that one. And to be truthful, the gods were so horrible that mm. I didn't mind them going. They were, they were not intelligent gods. <laughs> Everything they did simply brought on their own fate worse. Um, and when they rode out to be killed, they knew they were going to be killed. Mm -hmm. That's what they rode out for. They didn't ride out in order to have a victory over the forces of darkness or the fires of Serta. They rode out because the end was coming, and now they'd reached the end, and that was that. And <laughs> That's real war, no real mm. myth. It's real human life, too. Mm. Uh, I mean... So not a fairy tale? Not, not really a fairy tale, but um, it had enough of the trappings of a fairy tale mm. to be... Um, and I think even at that age, I spent a lot of time wondering what was the difference between a myth and a fairy tale. Because a fairy tale didn't seem to have a purpose like the myth did. Um, and, unless it was by Hans Andersen, who, as I have said before, is the most cruel writer I have ever met. I mean, he was the other person who sort of threw me into despair by doing terrible things to the Little Mermaid. And that story, you expect to come out well. And I once did a kind of poll. I went round and asked a lot of women, you know, which story do you remember from your childhood? And they all said, The Little Mermaid. And I mean, you can write a Freudian explanation of that. That's what you will do in your next novel, right? <laughs> uh, the next novel's about, so, no, the next novel goes to Germany and Austria. Okay. Um, the Little Girl and, and, and um, children's books and people who want to flee in children's stories is also a basic theme of, of uh, the children's book, the other novel we're going to talk about. People want to flee in stories and they always will. They always do and they, they need stories for two opposed reasons one of which is to make the world tolerable, because you can live in the story mm. rather than in the sort of muddle your life almost certainly is. Um, okay. And the other <laughs> is to teach you to understand things, because narrative, narrative um, puts things in a certain order so that you can see what they are. Um, I'm trying to review at the moment a book about Terry Pratchett and the science of Discworld. And there are two scientists writing about how we understand things. And I'm enjoying it immensely because they regard narrative as being absolutely essential to things like scientific understanding. If you can't tell the story, you don't understand it. So in a way, they, they cross each other. You tell stories to see what was happening, and you tell stories to get away from what was happening. That's exactly what you always do, in a way. Um take a distance and trying to understand things. Yes, I think, I think with every book I've written, I've got better at that. Um, I like the distance I'm at at the age of 76, much better than the distance I was at at the age of 18, writing my first novel as an undergraduate at Cambridge. I, I didn't like how close I was to the feelings of the characters. I enjoy feelings, and I think I do them better, and I think they go much deeper because of the distance. Um, it's, it's partly a shift in the pleasure in the language. I mean, okay. Increasingly, I, I look forward 
to making language. And increasingly, I think I can do this. Um, I wrote a sea story this week, which was published in The Guardian. Mm -hmm. And I always like discovering a new word. And I discover that the little pellets of plastic that are floating in the eternal sea and will never disintegrate are called nurdles, spelt with a U. And I invented the phrase sempiternal nurdles. Ah. And I'm still saying that to myself with <laughs> great pleasure. Good job. I think I may be the first person to have written about sempiternal nurdles. <laughs> the distant isn't, it's, it's, it's funny you say, making words, making literature, because that's how you think of it, making things. Yes, I see, I see the whole thing, again, increasingly as I get older. I see the whole thing as an enterprise and I use different metaphors. Mm -hmm. You know, Henry James talked about the figure in the carpet. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested in the whole carpet or in a wall hanging, or in a big painting. And in the children's book, I got obsessed with the structure of ceramics. Um, I think I partly do that because I have no sense of music. I, I, I mean, I don't hear my rhythms, don't hear music, I don't really listen to music. So the patterns have to be visual? Yes, and they have to be things. And I think with my fingers, I sit there with my fingers trying to feel what the shape of it is. Uh, if that doesn't sound too abstract. No. Um, and if I write a scene or think of an idea, I think what balances that in the whole pattern, as though I was painting. Um, and it doesn't mean I don't imagine my characters. When I actually get to them killing each other or loving each other, I can then enter into their minds and, and they do it. But I don't start with that anymore. I start with these very complicated patterns. Mm -hmm. And then I put the people into the patterns, which means I'm moving increasingly, as in the children's book, which is the only real historical novel I've ever written. <laughs> and I, I, I was no good at history at school. I was really useless at history. And so I had to learn how to think historically in order to write the children's book. It was the first time I'd read enormous numbers of history books ever. Um, as opposed that surprises to me. <laughs> um, and biographies come to that. I, I tend to read works of art and works of philosophy, and suddenly it came into making a pattern out of events that had happened, mm -hmm. like the First World War, as you said. And I, I suddenly had to understand that, which I didn't. But uh... Is that also, when we talk about distance, you talk about distance from the language and trying to understand, you talk about your age, but also going back to, to a period, like in a children's book, that also gives you a distance. Is it also easier that it doesn't come too close? No, I don't think it is easier because I don't think, I and mean, when I read a lot of historical novels about the childhood of Elizabeth I, that world was a world into which I was escaping. And I once flummoxed Lady Antonia Fraser by talking about good novels by Sir Walter Scott and bad novels by Sir Walter Scott. And I divided them as a child into those which were trying to explore history and those which were just telling you a romance. And um, she couldn't see that. She thought they were all novels by Sir Walter Scott. Um, but um, and what happened to me when I wrote, I wrote a sort of quartet of novels beginning with The Virgin in the Garden, which was in 1953, for various reasons that I didn't write them one after the other. So the first two were more or less contemporary novels about the world I was in. And the second two were already historical. I could research my own time because I was so much older. And so I could look in, I could research the hippies who I'd only seen from the you know, very edges. And, and that, that, that taught me a lot about how you could research a historical novel and actually illuminate your own world, because the world of the children's book, which is the world of the great moment of English children's writing, is, of course, the world of the books I read as a child. It, it's the beginning of my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's the world of the childhood of my parents. So I understood my father, who was a member of the Fabian Society, and a good Labour Party candidate. I understood him when he was dead much more 
than I ever had when he was alive. I'm, I mean, I understood him when I was alive well enough, but this was different. This was seeing him when I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was very interesting. But the times, as you can see, overlap, because yeah. some of it is my own life, some of, of course, it's a long yeah. way back, some of it's the Kaiser. <laughs> Do historical novels demand a special kind of imaginations? Because people would think, well, things are limited. It has to be correct. It has to be complete. Mm -hmm. um, nothing is ever complete. Um, it has to be as good as it can get. And you have not to invent anything in history. Mm -hmm. You can invent things in your novel. And one of the things I don't do, unlike other novelists, I don't have real people as my main characters. I feel it's vaguely wrong to go into the mind of the Kaiser, even if I could. Um, Why? I think he, he owns himself. You trapped him. You have the feeling of... Also, I don't want to put me between the Kaiser and anybody else. I think that's really what it is. I, I don't tend to read novels people have written about dead writers, because I want to read the writers, yeah. and I want to be related to them, not to yet another novelist. Um, so my historical fiction is always fiction. Yes. Oh, that's an important sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talking about historical fiction, um, the children's book is largely about imagination. It's about a lot of things. But um, Olive Wellwood tends to lose herself in imagination. She's a writer of children's books. And maybe the life she finds there is much more reassuring. She, I'm surprised sometimes. I, I don't m mostly read what people write about me, but there's a, a lot of sort of easy writing about the children's book that says she was a rich middle-class lady who lived in a house with servants. Mm -mm. She mm. was the daughter of a miner, and a lot of her early life was from the community in which D.H. Lawrence grew up. She lost her father and her brother in dreadful mining accidents, one by fire and one by flood. And she survived by telling herself stories and then by writing the stories. Um, so she isn't... It's surprising how many people think she's wicked because she writes stories instead of looking after her children. Maybe and she... Sorry, go no. ahead. Uh, I was going to say the book started with my observation that the children of children's book writers yeah. tend to commit suicide statistically much more frequently than most people's children. <laughs> now, this is weird. This is weird because this you think... This had to be explored. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer, but I think it is that the children's book writer is... I mean, Kenneth Graham is the worst and most awful one. They live in this imaginary world of, mm. of great sort of romance and interest and narrative, which ostensibly they're making for their child. But actually, the writer and the world are in a kind of circle, and the child is outside and can't get in. And um, in a sense, in, Olive isn't a very good example of that, because a lot of them don't grow up mm -hmm. completely. And I couldn't see, I tried, I couldn't see how she could have as many children as I needed her to have <laughs> and not have a bit of grown-upness in her. <laughs> so um, so she, she, she's on one edge of the um, rainbow of children's book writers. Yeah. And in the stories she writes, <laughs> she cannot hide the fact that, that she had a harsh life. No, and she writes about underground, completely compulsively, about people going underground. And she tells her son this long, long story about the boy who went underground. And I, I mean, I don't know if I ever wrote that, but I think she always meant it sometime to have an end when he got back above ground. But because it was a perpetual story that she told him every night, he had to stay underground. Um, and, and then it gets turned into a sort of Peter Pan play on the stage and he can't bear it, but because it's, it's his interior story and it's suddenly been mocked as he sees it. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the novel, Mrs. Wellwood is, is doing research, actually, <laughs> uh, 
and I'm going to try and um, quote. She says, I'm always searching for something that is missing, a story, something that can achieve magical powers, a mirror that shows the past and the future. As you can see, she says to the man of the museum, my fantasy is ordinary. I need your exact knowledge. Ah, uh -huh, yes, I'd forgotten that. Uh -huh. um, but it's a good metaphor for what you do. For? For what you do. It isn't, it isn't. She wants romance more than I ever did. There is do. a lot of romance in the novels. Yes, you might she, forget she is that. a romantic soul, despite being bashed about. Mm -hmm. um, whereas... Um, hmm, maybe I can't go there. Um, I don't, th I don't really us. don't think <laughs> I am a romantic soul. Excuse me? I don't think I have a romantic soul. I have a, a grim kind of Ragnarok sort of soul. Mm -hmm. um, and and Ol Olive really did want to write beautiful fairy stories. Yeah. I can't write children's stories. There's one unfinished one in there, mm -hmm. the, the two in fact, that I tried to write for my grandchildren and I couldn't end either of them, so I put them in the book. Um, That's good because then they're not captured into them. No, they're not. No, the children aren't captured and the stories aren't finished and nevertheless the idea has come into the light. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a people in the house in the house. It's the little girl who finds some tiny people and puts them in her doll's house. And then her house gets carried off by a giant and she is the doll in the doll's house. And, and this is a metaphor also, of course, for what I really do try not to do, which is putting people in books. Mm. I don't like to put real dead people or real living people without... The way to avoid putting real people in, supposing you think it matters, and I don't think it does for many writers, but it, it does for me for some reason. The way to avoid putting real people in is to mix them up with enough other people that you've got a kind of amalgamated person who is then free and, and can live its own life. And you know, you don't keep saying, E. Nesbitt is the nearest thing there was to Olive. Mm -hmm. And you don't keep saying, oh God, E. Nesbitt would never have done that because you don't have to, because Olive would. And then you get very annoyed with... I remember somebody once reviewed Possession. Yes. And found every line of the poetry that Robert Browning would never have written, which I had very carefully written... Of course. ..in order not to be written by Robert <laughs> yeah. Browning. It was... A, <laughs> you, you can't really win. The other thing, I, I had a letter from somebody in America just before I left for here, mm -hmm. and she was talking about how hard the historical novels were. And she said, people accuse you of nostalgia. And they have from time. I don't have it. I don't want to live oh, in You're a past. grim soul. Hmm? <laughs> you have a grim soul, as you say. Yes. No, you don't have nostalgia. But I think I cause it in other people if they're mm -hmm. reading innocently. I, I think that's what must happen. That's why I like... You, you mentioned the film of Angels and Insects. Mm. I like that very much because it was a hard little film. I mean, it was very moving and it was, was very romantic, but the structure, the internal structure of it was tough. Yeah. If you say, um, I'm not a kind of fairy tale person, I'm a Ragnarok person, <laughs> and I'm, I have a grim soul, um, there's always this sense of, in a lot of what you write, of this, this paradise, but also paradise lost. Yeah. And paradise has to do with nature. That's so important here. It all disappears, right? That's, I mean, we're in the 21st century. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. You should see what the scientists in my Terry Pratchett book say about yeah. it. <laughs> it's not good. They, they, yes, but they've reached the point of being in such despair that they can write really good prose about how it isn't good. And that's all, all I feel. That's all I feel one can do now. I mean, I, I better not get off on climate change, or mm -hmm. <laughs> that I think about it a lot of the time. I mean, the, the thin child in Ragnarok, um, the one thing she's sure about is that even if her father gets killed in North Africa in the Air Force or something happens to her, the meadows will go on and the hedges will go on and the birds will go on wheeling in great flocks through the sky. Most of those birds now are extinct. Gone. And I wrote a list of plants that came up between the corn. And I didn't say so, but every single one of those is now extinct. I, I, I found a book about the destruction 
of agricultural land. And I just listed the beautiful names of the plants that once used to be there. Um, I, I was quite pleased with that aspect of Ragnarok because I didn't want it to be an allegory. It isn't about human beings. Uh, and I think human beings are very like the Norse gods. They're, they're stupid. I do believe the European community could save the fish. I mean, could make the North Sea habitable for fish. And I just think human beings are so argumentative and so parochial and so short-termist. I don't believe we shall save the fish. I mean, I hope I'm wrong. But it, I, I watch, and there are going to be these big areas in which fish won't be fished. And then there are going to be fewer big areas in which fish won't be fished. And now there are fewer still. And you feel so helpless. But this novel does the work, but I don't think the European uh, leaders read this. Do you? Yeah. Do you think the European leaders read this book? No. <laughs> I don't think they do. I mean, that's, that's another thing about being a writer. Everybody thinks that novelists can change politics and they can change the world. Some do. The one who really did, who nobody respects, is Harriet Beecher Stowe. Okay. She really helped to abolish slavery. And I can't bear the way the Americans are not grateful to her. If you say that, and they say, she can't write very well. But she spoke very well. There are more than one. But apart from that book, I think most good is done by journalists. I think if you really want to save the world, you go and do good journalism in many languages. I don't write to save the world. I write, mm -hmm. I write to show people who want to see what it appears to me to be like. Um, and it will change one or two people, but they won't probably be the people you need to change. I mean, need to change the French and Spanish fishermen. They're not going to read Ragnarok. Uh, they're just not. <laughs> I think of what you said earlier, and that is I'm not a nostalgic person. But then if I, if I think of what you wrote and, and the aspect of, of um, paradise, that is always there, and the um, nature. There is a certain nostalgic tune to that, to I, that lost world. I am a paradise person. Yeah. Um, when I was a postgraduate student, I was writing a thesis on what happened to narrative between Spencer's Fairy Queen. I don't know how much mm -hmm. of this audience will know about Spencer's Fairy Queen, but it's the most beautiful allegory, unfinished, about, as it were, the courtly paradise, was mm -hmm. the image of Elizabeth, and paradise lost, which I think I used to say then that paradise regained was the first novel. Paradise lost was still a myth, just, mostly a novel, but, and I look back and you can still live in paradise if you read the right book, if you read The Fairy Queen or I had a fit of reading Dante because I was going to give a lecture that I then never gave. But you, you can live in other worlds. That's what art is for. Um, but you can't, you can't want to go back or wish you lived some other time, you, which is what I see nostalgia as. OK. Um, you, you live in the world that you happen to be in for a rather brief time. Maybe it's a different way of understanding nostalgia. Do you think people, um, if, you, if you write and it's finished, um, then it's finished for you, but then it starts with the reader. And then there's a lot of imagination that has to be done by the reader. Yes. Um, is that a nice feeling to, to realize that everybody reads their own book afterwards? Yes, it is. And um, one of the good things about having been successful is that you get enough letters to know just how differently everybody reads the book. Mm -hmm. And just there are some people who notice one thing. There are some that um, notice another. There are some that get it completely wrong. 
but nevertheless bother to write to you. Uh, and I mean, in the 1970s, of course, literary critical theory believed yes. that there was no wrong view. Anything mm -hmm. you said was equally as valuable as anything else. And that drove me mad because <laughs> I didn't want people doing structuralist, feminist, po postmodernist analyses of my book. I wanted them to read word after word what I wrote and not to be able to reduce them into these other words. Uh, of course, they had the right to do that. Uh, yeah, but still. But I didn't enjoy it. Um, whereas if somebody writes and said, I don't suppose anybody else has said to you, but, but I noticed the bit of seaweed on page 78 and how accurately it's described, I just feel happy. And each, that is the glory of being a novelist. Each reader is a different reader. No person reads the same two, no two people read the same book. Uh, there's a thing I, I, I like to say about imagining people. I say, can I got time to say it very quickly? Um, imagine to everybody in the room, imagine to yourself a woman. Now, none of you will be seeing the same woman. No. She's in a tall black chair. Now you will be seeing a woman slightly more like the other one. She's got a very tight green dress and her breasts are very big. And she has a lot of very red lipstick and she's got very high heeled shoes. Now you've got an image. Still, not one person in this room will be having the same mental image. They'll all be different. And that's what writing fiction can do that writing plays doesn't do. Um, and writing history doesn't do. Um, and I find it endlessly happy making. I sort of sit and think, you know, just how many visions of this tight green dress yes. are there in the world? And in fact, they're infinite. I mean, another thing I'm constantly thinking about is that somewhere by now there are so many human beings that two must look exactly alike but you never see them unless they're twins you just don't see them the world is full of a plenitude of, of people and things and colors and ideas um, and I, I enjoy all that and we enjoy it while you're speaking of it it's i mean this is imagination this is the yes, center it is. of it yeah could you tell us something about, I'm, I'm watching your Rolex. It's a Rolex, but it's, she didn't buy it herself. It, <laughs> it was a gift, she, she earned it, you deserved it. Um, I worked for it. You worked for it, that's it. Could you tell us something about the new novel or is that, is that kind of, let's not go there because? No, I, could, I, I, I seem to be rather unusual in that I never mind talking okay. about novels I'm working on. And one friend said to me after I'd been talking about it for quite a long time, she said, all you're doing is just going on working while you're talking to me. <laughs> I thought she was absolutely right. Go ahead and work. Yeah, uh, but mostly I find a novel begins, this is a really weird story, um, when two ideas come together. And I had an idea that you could write a wonderful novel about a group of, the early groups of psychoanalysts and their relations with each other and the kind of language they invented to describe their experiences. And then I said to my editor, who is a wonderful writer called Jenny Uglo, I said, Jenny, I've just been writing an article on the Surrealists and perhaps I'll write a novel about them instead of the psychoanalysts. And Jenny said, oh yes, that would be much better. So I, I was rather hurt, really, because <laughs> I thought the psychoanalysts were very interesting. And then I saw they were two sides of the same coin. They thought about dream worlds and the dark, and they were deeply affected by the First World War. Mm -hmm. And that's where it started. I started thinking about, oh, and also they lived in very tight groups, and each group had a leader, and the leader was known as the Pope, um, André Breton and Sigmund Freud. And the structure of the group was such that they automatically kept ejecting people from the edges. You know, when people lost the belief system, they had to be, Salvador Dali had to be ritually dismissed from the Surrealists and Aragon. And, um, and Freud was always pushing people out to the outer edges and saying, you're not an orthodox psychoanalyst, you're not part of my group. So I thought I could write a novel where the two groups sort of interact and the group behavior and the individual behavior and the languages they invented. Mm -hmm. You can see it would be beautiful, but I may not live long enough because it, it's very big. <laughs> Don't say that. You have, to, you have to be realistic. When will you start writing? This summer with any luck. I, I only really ever start a book in the summer because I get very bad winter depression. 
Um, so I do research in the winter. I retreat into Ragnarok or the mm -hmm. earthly paradise or whatever. And, um, and I write notebooks. And I write notebooks. And between one day and the next, the notes which were purely about history or ideas become, there is a character called Francis. Mm -hmm. He is a major in the army in the First World War. And then, he is and then I wait and see. And now I've got three sisters as well as Francis. And I've got some weird German artists in Berlin in the 1920s. And slowly they're all coming together. Um, but it's very risky because it might never quite come together. And that's the other good thing about having reached this age of writing. I have got myself out of this sort of mess before. I mean, the children's you know book was little... a very messy mess for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But it worked. Yes, it worked in the end. So, this so one... you, have the, you, you, you trust it? Yes. And I know wow. when to look away. That's another thing. I know when to stop trying when it won't work. Very important advice to writers. Don't go on working when it won't work. Do something else. Go on book tours. <laughs> thank you very much, Mrs. Byatt. Well, thank you.